Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. So great to see you all in here. Thank you for coming. My name is Casper Melville. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Arts. I know some of you and not others. Um, I, but more relevant for this event, I'm the director of the Festival of Ideas, the SOAS Festival of Ideas, of which this is part. In fact, this is the ninth event of the Festival of Ideas. Uh, the theme of the Festival of Ideas is thinking through music. We're thinking about music and we're using music as a way of thinking. And specifically, we've been thinking about music and dance. We've been thinking about, we've, we started off with a jam session with Steam Down over there with, and with SOAS students. We've had a panel on dance. We've had a panel on the relationship between music and film. We've talked about why Adorno hates jazz and why he's wrong about it. And uh, we've got a couple more events coming up. Uh, there's a panel, an online panel next Tuesday, which is about decolonizing music education with a great range of panelists, musicologists, ethnomusicologists, music technologists. Um, we've got a panel about the relationship between the visual arts and music on Thursday. And then we're wrapping up on the 30th with a big concert celebration of the relationship between SOAS and Mande music, that's the music of West Africa, and we've got the Kora master, Balake Sissoko, coming to play here, so you should grab yourself a ticket, he's a master, it's wonderful music. But today we're doing something else, I'm so happy, this is, you know, when I was putting this festival together, I thought, what should I make it about, and I decided to make it about things that interest me, in the hope that they also interest other people, and one of the things which interests me, and has always interested me for the entirety of my adult life, has been... DJing and DJs. I've written a book called Six of London Thing, which was kind of about DJ culture in London from the reggae sound systems of the late 50s all the way through to grime. Um, uh, and I find it a fascinating issue. And I have been lucky enough to manage to persuade an amazing panel of people to come together to talk about it. People, some of whom I know, some of whom I know of, uh, some of whom I've read their work. And I hope that we can get, have a really lovely conversation about the art, the craft, the job of being a DJ. What is it? What does it entail? And why it might be more than just a bit of fun on Saturday night, although it might include a bit of fun on a Saturday night. So um, why don't you... I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the panel to you. Oh, no, first of all, let me tell you the format of what we're going to do. So if we've got a two-hour session in here. We're going to talk to the... It won't go on for that long, don't we? But I'm going to talk to the panellists ask a few questions, get them to talk to each other and to me, and then we're going to throw it out and hopefully you can get involved as well. Uh, we'll, we'll find a natural end to that conversation somewhere in between now and 8 o'clock. Um, then we've got some snacks, which the DJs have already steamed into because, of course, they like to eat before they do their sets, um, which we will have in the lobby as we gradually make our way from here through the lobby to the Students' Union where we've got decks set up, CDJs set up, and we're lucky enough to have... Even more DJs, not just here, but sitting over here. So Tim, who's sitting right here, will be starting us off in the student union. We've got a late license in there, so we'll be there till two in the morning. Please do join us. Uh, I'm not sure our DJs will make it that long. We'll see. Anyway, I'm thrilled. Welcome, welcome. Let me, let me start at the end of the table. I'm going to work this way. And I'll tell you, I'm not going to give you the full bio because I wouldn't, we wouldn't have time, but let me just tell you why I invited these people and what I know about them. So at the end, we've got Lene Denise. Lene is someone I've come across, you know, on social media. I've heard her mixes, and I've actually... I know something about the academic work she's been doing as well in relation to DJing, a very, very interesting topic that we'll be talking about. Um, the reason why I feel so fondly about Lene in particular is because when I was finishing my book, I was thinking about who I could get to blurb it. It's really important that you have the right people blurbing your books, right? So I... I asked Paul Gilroy, and he said yes, and that was great. And I asked Giles Peterson, and he said yes, and that was also great. But I've lived in America for a long time in the 90s, and I've always considered my work and my interest to be sort of bringing the conversation between America and the UK together. So I sent it to Lene because I actually really wanted to know what she thought of it as an expert on black music, as a black American. And she wrote a really beautiful blurb, which you can read when you buy a copy of my book. Um, <laughs> So thank you for that, and um, I'm paying you back by asking you to do more unpaid labour. Uh, <laughs> thank you, and welcome, uh, Lene Denise, who goes by the name DJ Scholarship. And I, I should say that, you know, her work has been influential in me wanting to have this panel, and we'll find out why in a minute. Next to her is Harold Heath. Um, I don't know him personally. I've just met him, but I feel like I do know him because I've read a quite brilliant book that Harold wrote about DJing, which makes, I think, a really important point, which is that DJs, 
you know, we hear about the superstar DJs and we know about all the big money and the private jets and all of that. But actually, the vast majority of DJs are people who are doing it for very little money. In fact, they're putting their own money into it and they're doing it for reasons other than fame and wealth and adulation, although they'd welcome it if it came along. And I highly recommend this book. It's got the most wonderful title, Long Relationships, a Long Relationship, My Incredible Journey from Unknown DJ to Small Town, Small Time DJ. Is that right? I got that one right. Yeah. Highly recommended. Velocity Press. Very cheap as chips. You should buy it and read it. It's brilliant. Uh, he's also a, a working music journalist as well as being a long-time small-time DJ. Um, next to him is someone I think we wouldn't describe as a small-time DJ. This is Colin Dale. Uh, I don't know if you're a techno head, but if you're a techno head, you know Colin Dale, right? Colin Dale is a legend of techno. He's one of the people, amongst his many claims to fame, um, it, not only in the techno world, but all the way through from funky, soulful dance music of the 80s and reggae, in fact, all the way through to techno, is that he was one of the most influential people in bringing house music to London via his radio show, Abstract, the Abstract Dance Show on KISS FM, when KISS FM was a pirate station and good. Um, <laughs> it was a key, him along with another Colin, Colin Favour, and Jazzy M, probably the three of you can claim to be the people who brought... This is long before Rave, by the way, long, and, and it was nothing to do with Paul Oakenfold or Ibiza. Uh, next to Colin, we've got Nabia Iqbal. Um, she, one of the reasons I wanted to invite her, she's someone who's just come onto my radar. I knew she was working in a, a very interesting part of dance music, which kind of touches on a lot of different genres, including jazz and South Asian music. And I knew she had studied at SOAS, and I wanted to have a kind of someone from SOAS. She's one of ours. Uh, uh, and um, so I'm really thrilled. Thank you, Nabia, for being here. And uh, I look forward to kind of comparing notes, really, between people of different generations. And then sitting right here is Charlie Dark. And Charlie is, um, we have met before. We've been in many, many of the same places. We sort of come from roughly the same part of South London. He's a bit more West than me. Uh, we, we have friends in common, and I've followed his career all the way from Early Doors, Attica Blues. He's been a performing artist, radio DJ, and, uh, and a DJ, and also now a runner DJ, and runs the Run Dem Crew. So we'll maybe talk about that. So please welcome my fantastic panel. What a panel. Right, so we, we want to talk about DJing as something more than just having, you know, playing party music. That, that's going to be a lot about what we talk about. But I want to start with a couple of sort of reflections and a couple of propositions that we might just be able to get out of the way. The first reflection is that it was ironic in a way that setting up a panel where we're also having a party afterwards, it reminds me that being a DJ isn't just about playing music. It's also about, you know running around trying to find a cartridge for a 1210 deck because it's broken and having to go down to the shop and persuade the guy to rent you one. It's about cleaning stuff up and moving tables. It's about running a door. It's about promoting. It's about, you know, doing all the legwork that it takes to put a party together. Not always, but that's part of it. Um, but so here are two propositions for you, and I just want to see if you, you lot will agree with me. We c it's not that we won't talk about this stuff, but we can sort of move past it if you do agree with me. And if you don't, tell me why. So the first proposition is people, that DJs get into DJing fundamentally because they love music. That's my proposition. Are you prepared to agree with that? No. Hard agree from me. Yeah? yeah I agree. But Charlie, is, Charlie is a naysayer. I, I think they should get into music. Ah, Okay. They DJ because they're into music. Okay. I don't necessarily think that that has happened. But uh, that's last. true of every DJ, and there are other reasons why DJs might be getting into it other than the love of music. I think there's definitely a different reason now. Okay. Can we agree that everyone sitting at this table gets into DJing because of a love of music at the fundament? Yeah? yeah? Okay. We can move past that, but of course the love of music is going to come out as well. The second proposition is the primary role of the DJ is to move asses on the dance floor. Do you agree with that proposition? The primary role. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no. Um, no. I, I mean, I'd be inclined... T turn on your mic. But if, yeah. I'd be inclined to agree with that, me playing kind of electronic and uh, techno music. Um, maybe it applies more there, um, getting people up and dancing. So I'd, I'd agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Who, you, no, yeah, I think you, you uh, weren't sure about that. I think, like, on a dance floor setting, then it's definitely the primary goal. Okay, in the dance floor yeah. setting, I think that's a yeah. good way of putting it, that, of course. I feel like, um, as a DJ, you might play in a lot of other types of settings as well. So it just depends where and when and who's, who's your audience and what you're trying to do. Because, like, 
I mean, in the early days, this, I used to have this regular gig of DJing at Topshop, <laughs> which I just used to practice, yep. basically, because like, people aren't going to dance. Although some people did, but, you know, it's just there you just want people to notice the music at least. Okay, so it's not actually specifically about dancing. Yeah. Charlie, I think you disagreed as well, mm. didn't you? Uh, I think it's more about taking people on a journey mm. mm -hmm. than it is about primarily getting people to dance. Okay. And again, uh, I'm, I'm kind of coming at this with a bit of an older head, but I think there are a lot of people now who they just come out and they're playing whatever they... They, they, they will play whatever that gets the crowd moving. Yeah. I'm not necessarily concerned about taking people on the journey. Mm. Okay. But it's lowest co common denominator, <laughs> low-hanging fruit DJing. Okay. Can I, can I just jump in here? I do agree with what Charlie's saying, especially as you do radio shows. I do radio shows as well, and then there's a totally different angle on it. It's not about you know getting people to get up and dance, and then you can really take them on on some sort of journey. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you for those qualifications. I accept them. Obviously, you know, DJ, the term DJ, which is disc jockey, right? DJ, which derived from the radio function. And it was only later that the idea of, the, you know, it, back in those days, of course, most dancing was done to live music. OK, so we've got broad agreement, but we've got already we've got some, um, you know, disagreements, which is great and qualifications. Lene, I, I'd like to start with you because you've inspired this discussion and you've inspired me. And I, I'm interested. Tell, tell me about what you've cr tell me about DJ scholarship. You've called yourself. DJ scholarship. Okay, yeah. What what is it, and why? What what do you mean by that? Um, okay, so first of all, thank you um, for allowing my work to inform <laughs> the conversation. Um, so I don't call myself DJ scholarship. Um, my name is Lene Denise, um, but I have created a system of sounding that I call DJ scholarship, um, which is a form of scholarship that is committed to a critical listening practice, and it's about listening to for me, um, race and music and place matters. And so DJ scholarship is about a critical listening practice that centers sort of rhythmic, you know, regional forms of black expression. And so I'm interested in Detroit techno, Chicago house, LA gangster rap, um, uh, you know, um, South African kwaito, right? So music and place matters. But for me, DJ scholarship is also bound up with listening to black folks broadly, listening to their literature, listening to film, listening to sort of diasporic echoes of black lived experience, um, as my partner would say. So I think that it's just about a, a sort of, I hope, humanizing um, listening practice that engages music beyond its entertainment value. Mm -hmm. And there's something ambivalent about that entertainment value. Let's just kind of cut to the chase about <laughs> that. In, in that, you know, the American music industry has been an, uh, an extractive industry mm -hmm. which has taken the raw material which has primarily been produced by African Americans and exploited it without returning the benefits back. Yeah. A and that continues in your view? I mean, I'm thinking about that in the UK context in terms of, I mean, you know, Island Records comes up for me. I think it's a kind of global exploitive extractive practice. Mm. Um, and I think there's evidence that points to um, a system that, you know, especially I'm thinking about just the, the black Atlantic experience and, and the kind of corporate sort of circle around the way that we make sounds and music in our community. So yeah, my focus as a black American is on thinking about the relationship between um, slavery and, and the music industry, right? And, and the, the American sort of music industrial complex that developed and emerged alongside um, the quote unquote reconstruction era, right? With the kind of hyper exploitation of witnesses of slavery who then go on to create this thing called the blues, right? So I just think that it's a global practice, but certainly rooted in the system of slavery, which is a transatlantic endeavor, so. In terms of your interest in place and locating, can you just give us an idea of where you came up as a DJ? Where was your kind of yes. testing ground? And um, That's important. So I am a Capricorn. Um, I think <laughs> that's Hi, important. Hi, Sagittarius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, but I, I'm, you know, I'm from Los Angeles. I was born in 1975, born and raised, which means that I witnessed the 80s. Um, and I witnessed the sort of emergence of electronic music. Um, and so, you, it, interestingly enough, I'm thinking about the role that Dr. Dre played in developing my ear because he was a DJ on, 
in LA's first hip hop radio station, which was called KDAY. Mm -hmm. So I listened to KDAY closely. I bought, you know, Maxwell cassette tapes. I recorded shows. I listened to those shows for hours. I memorized lyrics. I wrote those lyrics out. I used to break dance to those lyrics. I would go to school in Battle Fools. Like, so <laughs> it, was a, it was a way of life for me in the 80s. That's Los Angeles for me. Wonderful. Um, Harold, um, I'm imagining that you've got a different story, that it wasn't L.A. Don't <laughs> um, And, and just, just, it's very interesting that I, I think on this panel, I don't know how we're going to cut it, but you know, some of us are from the pre-hip-hop. We discovered music before hip-hop, and hip-hop is obviously such an important bedrock for so many people. But I'm going to speculate, Harold, that you are, you, when you were kind of discovering music, it was before hip-hop or early just it was uh so electro which was kind of pre-hip-hop is that working where, where were you where was your uh, so i grew up in a little town called Bray St edmunds which is in suffolk um there was there a hooray there there was <laughs> yeah yeah <Why? laughs> it's the east anglia massive yeah, mate, <laughs> uh, and so my first real love was music like all the people here i was really into buying records even as a little kid but um it was electro in i don't know 82 those kind of first records were and uh the kind of birth of breakdancing in this country as well. I was a breakdancer. You were a breakdancer as well, so... Fastest backspin in Berry, by the way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was my gateway into the kind of culture that, for me, is, uh, yeah, like into dance music culture, really, that whole... Because it wasn't just the music, right? It was uh, graffiti, it was the clothes, it was the way you spoke. Yeah, I'm mean, thinking of the, the difference, thing. in a way, between what Linnea said and you. You know, I mean, there's a racial difference, right? And... So for you, and I'm here, I, I'm, not, I'm not just pinning on you because I think it was myself as well. It was, um, it was a, something a little bit more remote in a way. We were looking, a, we were looking at something else. And, you it's know, the, the graffiti, the break dance. That you see throughout history of white people in Britain going, that black stuff is really good. Yeah. I mean, it's as simple as that. Yeah. We loved that culture. We just embraced it wholeheartedly because it was, it was better than what we had here. It was better than what we had here. And this is the, the two sides, in a way, of what we've talked about in terms of the extraction and the appropriation and some of the troubling things which have happened. Because I would imagine, Harold, you would want to argue that there was some, you know, that wasn't strictly you just trying to take something and make money from it or something. It wasn't. Not at the time, no. <laughs> <laughs> like that later on, obviously. That. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my friends fell in love with it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's, like I say, that's happened in history for as far back as I can see with popular music. In this country, we used to think George Formby was a bad jam until we discovered black music, do you know what I mean? And I think it's such an important point, isn't it, that, you know, growing up as a white English bloke, yeah. like we both did, you know, the, the, the available music culture was naff. It wasn't good. Yeah. It wasn't, you know... and. There was and no it, dancing, there was no art, there was, uh, you know, people would... The culture was you go to a nightclub and everyone gets drunk and, you know, you try and pair try off. Try and pair off, yeah. And yeah. do silly dances, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Comedy dances and stuff. It's and I don't know about your family wonder. background, Harold. What, did you have music in your family? Did you inherit a musical culture? Uh, not particularly, no. It was just me and my friends. That's what we... Yeah, what same with me. I mean, my parents' musical culture was one that they had aspired to, you know, classical music. It was something that they... But, but it didn't feel that it was part of a family. Put it like this, I never danced with my grandma. Right? Or I never saw my aunts dancing. Now, to move on to Colin, right? so we're of a similar generation, maybe, Colin. In fact, you and I grew up very close to each other, but you grew up within an, an Afro-Caribbean family where music did matter in a different way. Right? Just describe that. Um, sorry. Well, yeah, with uh, a lot of black and uh, Afro-Caribbean and uh, African families, music very important and... Um, I was lucky enough to have uh, parents that were really, in, really into music, like reggae music and um, soul music, um, Motown and stuff like that. And um, so I, I got into music really early, about 16, 17. Um, I started doing some very, very local um, pirate stations, um, and stuff like that. And that was born out of having a record collection. It was only tiny back then that I wanted to share with people. And I, and I wasn't hearing it on the radio I was listening to, which, you know, kind of pushed me into doing it myself. And i um, uh, done a lot of radio, worked in record shops for about 15 years, pushing the music as well. And then landed at Kiss FM, um, spent 18 years there, um, uh, with the radio show. But can I take you back to, like, the, uh, something I remember, I, we, I've interviewed Colin before very kindly, and I've used some of this interview in my book, and the thing that I found really interesting that you were telling me, so you grew up not like 
the white English people who were your neighbours, because I was one of them and I didn't have that reggae culture. It was, I could hear it, but I didn't mm. have it in my family. But you also sort of broke away from that in a way. And, and oh, it, you found that a little bit... You, you, you told interesting stories about how your cousins and your family sort of oh, yes, treated you, breaking yeah. away from reggae into another kind yeah, of musical yeah. genre. I was, I was called names um, um, uh, for breaking away from... Um, reggae music and that, but for me it was a natural thing. Lots of 16, 17, 18 year olds don't listen to the same music as their parent. Might have shades of it, but it's usually not exactly the same. And uh, also when I started, I uh, my friends were like Fabio, Groove Rider, Jumping Jack Frost and Dave uh, Angel. lots of DJs that went on to do really, really well. We are all from the same area and um, all started at the same place, pretty much, and and that was actually that was the roots of me uh, playing music, really. Yeah. It? From a very young age, and and even and though you were moving towards, you know, disco, you liked up tempo dance yeah, music and disco. disco the good. model that you were working with, the way, the reason that you knew that what a DJ was, presumably, was based on sound system culture because it was all around you. You knew there was vinyl records. Kind of. People put records on. You yeah, know, made a loud noise. Kind of. I, I mean, I what really got me into the DJing because I, I didn't go to a lot of reggae dudes to be totally honest um, back then. So I, for me, it was DJs like um, Robbie Vincent and Froggy and Steve Walsh was another these one. Called and, the Soul Mafia back when we were young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. that you know, I started following these guys and. That was the first time I saw two mm. turntables, really. They weren't mixing as such, unless you were froggy, but, you know. Of course, that's right. And if you go to some reggae sounds, like you go to Jar Shaka, and there aren't two turntables, there's, there's one, one, and it's and, right up and here, two, yeah. at the top of his head, over exactly, his head. Exactly, yeah. 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 It's, you know, two wow. very different things. Nabiha, I think, I, I get the impression you're a slightly different generation. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so what was your kind of I intro into musical culture and then DJ culture? Um, well, music was always my favourite thing growing up, and Michael Jackson was my first musical obsession. Of course, when I was a baby, and my mum has <clears throat> a lot of stories about me watching this tape of like a Michael Jackson documentary that they had taped off TV, and I watched it so much that the tape broke, <laughs> and then I threw like a massive tantrum. So then they had to go out and buy me this other Michael Jackson video, which I remember really vividly still because I used to watch it every day. So that was like my earliest musical memory. But my parents weren't, like, particularly musical. The household wasn't really. But they, like, pushed us to learn a lot of instruments and stuff. And I went to music school every Saturday. And I played the flute and took recorder really seriously and played, like, desk and, and treble. And I was in a recorder ensemble and then guitar as well. Um, and then I guess, like, in terms of finding my own path and, like, and what I liked in music, it wasn't through the DJ club scene at that time because it was like late 90s, early 2000s and I was really into like punk and metal music. So my first experience of ex like of feeling music in a loud environment with people around me would be like at the Underworld in Camden or Electric Ballroom and just like used to go to gigs every weekend um, from like the age of 13 onwards. Like it, that was just it really. Mm. And then, um, yeah, just loved music and then coming to SOAS for university and studying I did a joint honours of history and ethnomusicology and I'd say that was one of like the most eye-opening formative experiences for me in terms of like a, a musical education <clears throat> but in a broader sense than just like learning music but realizing that there's so many different types of music from all around the world and things which to our like western trained ears wouldn't even sound like music but you can still appreciate it and it also made me think about not playing or listening to music for music's sake, but mm. just like the, the kind of like wider meaning and power of music that exists. And sometimes when, I mean, me growing up in London and you just watch like Top of the Pops and you go to gigs and you just think like, okay, it's like entertainment value. It makes you feel good, obviously. But then you don't think, you don't necessarily think deeper than that. Mm. But... I'd say, you know, like being in a nightclub and listening to like amazing techno house really loud with all your friends around you is like one of the most spiritual experiences you can have, really. And for me, I think there's feelings that I get from music that I don't get from anything mm. else in my life, like not human relationships, not film or art or anything. <laughs> no, music doesn't let you down. <laughs> <laughs> 
So it's fun. I, 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 on our dance panel, it was funny because um, one of the panelists was Indy, DJ Rupture. She runs the drum and bass, the bass thing, 10 years, proper hardcore drum and bass. And she talked about how in the middle of a drum and bass thing, when people are slapping the walls and it's incredibly loud, she can find a moment of stillness yeah. and almost a sort of meditative escape from the world, yeah. close the eyes and you kind of lose yourself. Mm. Exactly. It's very, it sounds very similar to and what Those rhythms saying. are so intricate and so fast and it's just, yeah, it's something else really. Mm. I feel like when I listen to drum and bass music, I hear doubler, like the when you, you know, the Indian drumming, those patterns are so similar and I'm sure a lot of the drum and bass producers in like the 90s were probably influenced by people like Talvin Singh. Well, of course, with there was the, the, the moment of so-called New Asian cool with yeah, the Talvin yeah. Singh and uh, Anoka at, um, at the Blue Note. Exactly, yeah, and Goldie and people like that mm. as well. So, yeah, I mean, that's just a good example of thinking about music with no borders, in a sense, you know? Mm. Everything is mixed and every everything's always evolving and things are being, like, borrowed and adapted. And I just think mm. it's beautiful. Um, and then in terms of DJing, I guess, like, the... So from, yeah, from uni times onwards, or probably just after, me and my friends, like we, me and my friends who also did music, we always used to put on our own parties in London. And the first time I started, uh, that I ever DJed was um, at this series of parties that we put on in laundrettes, mostly around East London. And it started because one of my mates was living in a flat above a laundrette on Columbia Road and somehow persuaded the landlord to let him use the laundrette <laughs> one Saturday night <laughs> for a party. And then... Um, and Tell me you call it My Beautiful Laundrette. Sorry? Did you call it My Beautiful Laundrette? Oh, no. no you're too, we didn't you're call too, it anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was just those parties. <laughs> but, yeah, and anyway, it just, that kind of, like, motif just stuck with us. So we put on different laundrette parties, and um, I learned how to DJ using a controller. That was, like, my first experience of it. Um, Sorry, what's a controller? Like a, so it was, it was like a, a controller that's sort of, like, a... Uh, mimics what a, a normal DJ setup would be with like a mixer and two turntables or two CDJs, but you link but it all... to a laptop yeah. and, and it works with a software program. Yeah. So I was using Traktor. And I, I feel like that um, technological change is actually so amazing because it's really opened up the world of DJing to so many more people. Yeah. It's expensive to buy turntables and yeah. a mixer. And I very much wanted to get onto that subject, and I, I'm glad you brought it up, and we will get onto it yeah. when, when we find out a little bit about Charlie's entry into this, into this world then. So, um, I always tell people that I got into raving, clubbing, music and DJing in the best era, which is the 80s. Because <laughs> I think if you got into it in, into the 80s, then basically you, you saw the progression of vinyl, CDJs, mm. two-inch tape to DAT, that to CDR, you, you know, small clubs, basement clubs, into super club. You've seen all of the different kind of um, shifts that have happened. Mm. So it holds you in good stead to kind of survive during current times. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of blessed in that my mum is from Ghana in West Africa and she studied in New York during the 60s. And she lived opposite the Apollo Theatre. Mm -hmm. So wow. she came, when she came to London, she came, arrived with a suitcase, a summer dress and a box of records. Mm. She didn't have a winter coat. <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, music, you know, a lot of the music that people kind of fetishise over and have kind of collected and kind of mythologise was never special to me because it was just music that was played in the house, particularly on a Sunday when it was like chores day. Most African... The music and chores thing is quite... Music chores, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know... James Brown forever reminds me of cleaning the stairs. <laughs> um, but we had one of those classic rooms in the house that no one else was allowed in because that's where the sound system was. And it was a valve sound system. So, again, you know, if I go to, like, one of these analogue kind of super valve, you know, audiophile things, I'm like, I grew up with that. That's just <laughs> normal stuff that we had in our house. This wasn't something that was special. Um, one of the best things I think that happened to me is I got sent to private school. I got an assisted place to go to private school in Dulwich. In, um, and being a fish out of water, you kind of have to cling on to things that help you kind of survive the, this baptism of fire that you've been placed in. And because I had music, I had records, and I was one of the only black kids in the school. There was like probably 2,000 kids, probably only four black kids in this whole school. So people just immediately assumed that I knew about music. So when people got to the point where they started having birthday parties, they were just like, you look like Charlie was music. It. <laughs> Can you DJ? And... You know, I think the 80s was a real period of DIY, say yes, 
and learn how learn how to fly on the way down. Mm. So you had a lot of people being like, oh yeah, I can DJ, I make beats, I make music, mm. I can do this, I can do that. No idea how to do it. Mm. But we learned how to say yes early. Mm. And that was kind of, you know, my thing was DJing at school people's parties, gate crusher balls, you know, various underground parties. Gate crusher balls. How interesting, because there, there's a connection there between gate crusher balls and rave, isn't there? Because yeah. The Tony Colston haters and those characters yeah. who went from gate crasher balls were the balls for the posh kids. Yeah, it's kind of uh, rather sort of decadent kind of posh parties, which then they realised it was right around. Yeah, the, a lot of those guys break came, to rave, you know, yeah. rave promoters. Yeah, Let, let's talk a little bit. Thank you. That's really really interesting. Let's talk a little bit about scenes because I'm really interested in um, in just sort of locating key scenes in in your musical development. And I know that you know music. We've talked about how it all links together, and it's you know people can get obsessed. But, Lene, you, you told me that you, you played in San Francisco and you were quite specific when we talked about the, the scene that you played in San Francisco. I'd lived in San Francisco almost at the same time, but unlikely to have visited those scenes. Just describe that, that scene and what was going on there. Because I th there's an issue around house music mm. involved in that as well, isn't there, in terms of how house is understood and how it's been, um, you know, marketed to us. And <laughs> what was that all about? What were you playing? What kind of thing were you playing? Well, first in San Francisco. of all, yeah, that's I, so I bought my first decks in San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, and so that's why it's significant um, to me. But I was a part of the sort of underground hip hop Bay Area scene. But I think the scene that developed my approach to the decks was actually in New York, right? And just the underground house music club scene there. Mm -hmm. um, that was in conversation with the art world, and the, right. So I think that there's a again the listening, the reading as a part of the scene that my work is contextualized in yeah. and, and developed in. But, yeah, for the Bay, I mean, you know, when I think about the history of DJ culture and turntablism and um, Q-Bird and, like, these hardcore Filipino crews yeah. in the Bay yeah, Area, yeah. like, huge. Um, Souls of Mischief. Souls of Mischief, absolutely. Um, the, what are they called, the uh, 1200 technique? Do you, do you guys remember? 1200 hobos. No. Oh, what are they? I can't remember. It was the Scratch Pickles. No, not no. them, and All I right. don't know them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, yeah, but so that wasn't, I mean, part of what I was doing um, was, you know, developing a crew of women DJs mm -hmm. um, in San Francisco. So our scene was about, yeah, we had an event, a party called She Story, um, which is very corny when I think about it now, but very important in kind of helping me develop the confidence I needed to step to this game, right? Knowing we were being paid less, knowing we were expected to not excel and understand these kind of um, technological conversations, right? And and just sort of being erased and marginalized and suffering the economic consequences of being black and woman and queer. So our scene was about developing um, a kind of visibility and kind of demanding value by, you know, creating momentum around the work and then demanding that we be paid Mm. What, what, what these folks were paying. Well, I'm still trying to think of the the crew, the 1200s. I'll come back to that. But they yeah. were just like <laughs> these massive DJs that we know were being paid, right? And so we would be I see. You were paid looking to come in. And race was a, con a divider race, here, right? gender, and sexuality, sexuality. right? Yeah. And money. Yeah. So I, I just, I'm just thinking about gender equity and, <laughs> and turntable culture and what scenes means in that kind. What yeah. scenes, what a scene and, and it was politicized, right? Even if it wasn't every track wasn't about having didn't necessarily have political content the whole thing couldn't help but be yeah have a political D content yeah i mean to survive and to <laughs> to be able to play the music of folks who we know were suffering to to play music that we know folks were creating under duress right because we're talking about the 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 90s mm. and we're talking about people who survived the 80s you're talking about like you know what was going on with reagan um so this california scene is informed by the fact that Reagan became president, but started out as a Hollywood actor. He then became a California governor, and then right, like that he was part of kind of dismantling social systems. That he mm. was part of reversing civil rights gains, right, which meant um, dismantling social programs that fed, you know, um, you know, young folks the sort of skills they needed to be creative. So mm. what we were doing 
in terms of this scene was trying to figure out how to be creative in the midst of like depleted resources. And of course, during the nineties, you know, the Fillmore district was being, you know, deracinated. Oh wasn't yeah, it? It was absolutely. Being knocked down, and you know, the, the black community was being ousted really from absolutely San Francisco. Absolutely in the Bay. Yep. Um, talking about scenes, Harold, would I be wrong in suggesting to you that the rave scene was an important part of your? upbringing and life and no, orientation. You would be right there, Casper. It was terribly important. Tell me about your... Right, tell uh, me what happened and tell me <laughs> how it felt. Uh, well, OK, uh, so the rave scene... What, uh, what happened? I don't know where to start with that. To <laughs> what happened to you? You can tell it through your eyes. OK, maybe. so Colin will know, because Colin was playing on the rare groove scene, right? You were playing funk records and that in the mid-'80s, all yeah. these rare funk records that were getting sampled in hip-hop. Uh, me and my mates were really into that scene kind of thing. We thought it was amazing. But it's a kind of a weird little pause, right? In it was a backward-looking moment, or a kind of educational moment, wasn't it? It was kind of like, yeah. let's learn about the American funk world yeah. in the 60s and 70s. You know, it's kind of looked down upon a bit, that scene. I thought it was absolutely fantastic, because people like me got to discover this whole new world of incredible music that we didn't even know existed. You never heard it on the radio. So it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that, uh, you know, as DJs, it's all about looking for this special stuff, right? The, the stuff that you don't know about, you don't hear about. But while that was all happening, uh, kind of obviously house music was being invented and techno was being invented in America. And then at some point it just came over here, didn't it? 87, 86? For me it was probably 88, 89 because I was living uh, away from a metropolitan centre, so uh -huh. it kind of arrived a little bit later. And in what way did it arrive? Like how did you, did you suddenly notice, like there's just a very loud noise it somewhere changed. over there in the field? I know, man, it changed everything. Uh, the music <laughs> came first um, and we were all a bit sniffy about it for about two weeks. Yeah, we like, I remember that. Much too fast. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean. Where's the soul? Exactly that, yeah. And then we would go to, a, went to all, all of us went to a first rave and had that experience and we came out and thought, oh, okay, we get this. This is something new. Everything about it was new and exciting. The music was like we'd never heard before. It was like music from space, but also the experience of all us people being there. For a lot of uh, people like me, it's the first time we would dance with people from different races, cultures, sexualities, and it didn't matter. It wasn't a big thing, do you know what I mean? So as a 16, 17-year-old kid from the sticks, it's just amazing. It's beautiful. It's uh, literally changed my life and I'm here whatever 35 years later talking about it because it's totally fo been the focus and the driver of my life ever since then those, those yeah those days changed everything for me yeah they showed me the power of music the power of a crowd what it's like to be in that moment with people completely forgetting <coughs> your own ego and just letting go and just going with it and experiencing those moments of transcendence mm. that you know, they're quite rare. Really. I'm interested in this kind of, in the tensions that come along in these kind of things. So I remember, Colin, when we were talking, not only did your reggae boys find it odd that you wanted to go and listen to disco, but um, the what, what Harold's just described, the reluctance of the rare groovers and the soul crowd to accept house or face up to it led you, in, you know, to, to, to have to struggle quite a lot to sort of introduce that music. I remember you telling me a story about being hired for a night at, Bob, at a Bobby and Steve club. Bobby and Steve were these Ball two guys who played, you know, up, Nice, good house music, but it was more of that kind of New York, gospel -y, sort of four to the floor. And you were playing more abstract, you wanted to go harder, and they sacked you, right? Well, no, that's not, that's not the exact truth. <laughs> OK, sorry. No, we I've, we I've were actually it. doing a... Uh, it was like a disco soul and funk night. OK. This is back in the, the late 80s, and um, I could really see a connection in between um, the soul and funk disco music and, and house music. So I, I attempted to in introduce it at the club, and they sacked me for doing that. Only to, you know... Rehire you. <laughs> no, not rehire me. A few years later, be known for pushing that music. Oh, I see. The irony of it. They sacked me at the time. Yeah. But... Very soon after that, I think you and the posse that you've just talked about, Fabio and Groove Rider and, and um, you know, Dave Angel and whatnot, found yourself playing at these mega raves. To just describe I mean, a scene of, of a, one of these out of town. I mean, for us, it was really strange because we, it, these guys, the names you mentioned, we all come out of a, a basement, a shub in, in Brixton. It was illegal. And sort of Thursday, Friday and Saturday nights after heaven, everyone would go down to this shubbing in Brixton. Yeah. And uh, so in the space of about six months a year, all these guys, myself, Groove Rider, Fabio, went from playing, you know, this really tiny place where there were 60 people to doing these really massive 30,000 people mega raves. And, you know, in a really short space of time that everything it just blew up so how did you feel much? suddenly stepping up onto a gantry and looking out on thirty thousand people um, do you remember were you nervous how did it 
It was... Um, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't nerves actually, because I was swept up in this thing that was moving so fast. I didn't have, even have time to think about it sometimes, and. Because it was happening to a lot of my peers, um, I, it was happening to all of us at the same time. Um, but yeah, it was a magical time when, when it when it all blew up and that. And um, like I said, amazing scenes, these massive clubs we're flying all over the world, and it, it was just amazing to go from from one extent to the yeah, other in a, yeah. quite a short space of time. Yeah, Charlie, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna come back to you, Nabiha, because your story starts a bit after what, what about you Charlie I mean I associate I'm probably wrong about this but especially Attica Blues in that period of time there was a there was a reaction against rave culture and against house music I remember going there was a club called slow motion which was yeah. which was definitively 80 bpms or slower and yeah. it, was an, it was the anti-house club yeah. and it was where a lot of the kind it was a great club Ronald and Blaze yeah. and it was where the kind of multiculti London sort of ta you know artsy farty people now I suspect a lot of them were sneaking off to raves as well because I was as well and I would see them there <laughs> yeah. you know and they kept it on the DL <laughs> yeah. right yeah. but is that fair because Attica Blues is much more is a much slower was more yeah. associated with uh, Charlie was in a band called Attica Blues I should say on a label called Moex and, and Moex itself was kind of more associated with a slower more downbeat um, sort of feel more how more weed than E more weed than E. Okay. So how did you feel about that situation? Well, Is that a fair... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think for the people who... I think what people have to understand about the context of mid to late 80s going into 90s is the musical divides that were amongst people where it was very, very tribalistic. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, when you tell people now, like, oh, all my friends were into reggae and then I went off into house and I got ostracised from the community, mm -hmm. people are looking at you like they don't understand it. No, they really but don't. it really was a case of, like, you literally would turn up, you look at someone's shoes, they're wearing Clarks. That's a reggae man. OK, fine. <laughs> and, and, you know... Clark on foot. Yeah, Clark on foot. <laughs> so for kind of black kids, like, you know, I call us the original black nerds, pre Pharrell. Like, you get into skating. And skating starts to open up your mind to all this different stuff. So things like Cybertron, clear. Mm. I never knew that was a techno record. That was just a hip-hop record to me oh. that got played. Mm -hmm. Craftwork, I didn't associate them with techno. I associated them with hip-hop. There's all this stuff that I learned, you know, later because you couldn't even go to a techno jam because you would turn up to the door and a bouncer would look at you and be like, not tonight, lads. It's not your night. Because there was a racial quota. All the clubs had a even quota. Even if Colin was playing. Then, even right? if Colin was playing. There was a racial quota on a lot of the clubs about the amount of people of colour that were allowed into the club. So even if you were into this super futuristic music, you couldn't go and hear it. Mm. So when you found people that either had tapes, cassettes, do you mean, who had access, had a bring-in, you just gravitated towards them like glue. The whole Attica Moax thing was more a reaction against hip-hop because for a lot of us, it's kind of, you know, hip-hop was the music that arrived around, you know, you know, Early 80s, the electro compilation albums, you know, we gravitated towards it. There weren't a lot of hip-hop jams. You were going to the jams. First time I met kind of suburban B-boys, you know, really important thing, like them countryside kids that would just knew more about hip-hop than you. That would make you go and research even more because you just couldn't bear the fact that some bumpkin kid knew more about, you know what I mean? Maybe from Barry St. Edmunds. Maybe it was. <laughs> uh, you know, again, this is all part of the come up. Um, but I think for a lot of us what happened is Public Enemy came to London in 86, 87. And as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned, after we walked out of Brixton Academy... It was Academy, wasn't it? London was never the same. Because you basically had, you know, predominantly black... But it was a mixed crowd, but I think it was the first time that you heard people on stage really talking about stuff that you hadn't been taught in schools and you hadn't yet heard on record. Mm. And so you literally just, you know, it was literally like Chuck D dropped the mic at the end... And you had a decision. You either, you know, you turn in Muslim next day. I knew, like, some of the... <laughs> I'm, it's, you know, and it's, and it's what happened. Literally, yeah. the biggest bacon sandwich eating... <laughs> jerk ribs, yeah. all of that. Literally, the next day, we're like, I'm changing my name. Yeah. I'm going to stop wearing beads. I'm mm. going to go on a pilgrimage. <laughs> I'm hanging out with the Muslim kids. I'm out. Like, you literally, friendships were severed. <laughs> That's so true. The thing about that show, I remember that show, was how, you know, they had that, that kind of army, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. They're yeah. Dancing. And it was, it was very performative. It was almost camp, the way yeah, that they yeah, sort yeah, of danced yeah, around the yeah. stage. There was something yeah. Yeah. unusually 
yeah. performative about the whole thing. I East think. London came to South... Because that was another thing as well. Was like the, the South London didn't have tube stations. Mm. So if you Your bit of South London. This is... Sorry. I, li- I lived in Stockwell, right? Yeah, we had the Victoria Line. He's <laughs> over that way. It's not proper South. Battersea. They don't know about tubes in That's Battersea. It's all buses. Sorry, this is local business. But I mean, oh, <laughs> what I meant was by that is like if you went to a jam and there was someone from South London there, you knew they were into music because it was they hard had to get, there. To, yeah, get yeah. to the places. Yeah. Yeah. East London people always travelled en masse. So that was another thing about that Brixton Academy concert is like the EL posse who used to follow Derek B, mm. you know, great DJ, if you don't know about Derek B, check him out, yeah. came on force. So it was like the scene of the Warriors at the end of that concert. You How know, are they going to get home? And everyone was kind of going off in different directions. <laughs> yeah. And I just think, for a lot of us, we came out of that and we're just like, you know what? We don't have guns. We don't have gold chains. We're not driving Jeeps. Like, this, we've been obsessed with American hip-hop culture for so long. But actually, if you look around where we live, mm. our lives are really, really different. Mm. And if we want to make an impact in this music world, we're gonna, we can't just carbon copy what these American cats are doing because it will never be accepted. Such an important moment. And so that's, you know, some of us went off down the, the trip-hop route London Posse started rapping in their own accents. In their own accent, you know, Rodney, yeah. Loads of kind of repercussions started happening. Which obviously you can trace it then yeah. straight into uh, the, the MCs in Jungle, yeah. in Garage. Great. I always loved Rave. I, like, I loved Rave. I loved House. I loved all of that because it was futuristic and it was new. And it was, you know, as, you know, as... And that point about kind of were you scared about playing in front of 30,000 people? Of course you weren't because you spent so many years being contained in your bedroom, mm. waiting for this moment. So a lot of those guys, when they came out, they were the best DJs in London. Yeah. They just weren't being talked about or recognised mm. or spoken about as the best DJs in London. Absolutely. But it's yeah. the same as the EZ Boiler Room moment. That's right. Anyone who knows DJ culture yeah. knew that by the time EZ was doing Boiler Room, I was like, oh, man, he's about to kill it. Yeah. These people don't even know what's about to happen. Mm. Yeah. And then you saw it, and it's kind of... You're just sitting there laughing. People like, knew. People knew. Yeah. Nabir, I just want to bring you in. I'm sorry, I don't want to sort of you know, c- cliche you as the younger generation, this but I am interested... For me, oh, listening to yeah, what well, I was going to say... Sorry. I was going to say, does this talk that you've just heard, in terms of these kind of very strong generic tribal affiliations and whatnot, does it sound familiar? Did, was there an equivalent when you were sort of getting into mu- music, or is it something from the past and it's not like that anymore? You talked about how the kind of technology you were using gave you access to a lot more music for a start, and you could play across genre. Were you able to play across genre when you were DJing? Yeah, I mean, I've always played across genre because that's just what I love doing, like taking people by surprise and mixing things together that you wouldn't normally put together. So, like, I don't know, it might be like Rihanna with some like Arabic dance music and stuff. But I feel like those things are happening a lot more now. But when I was first doing it around, like, 2009 or 2010, like, you didn't hear that much, like, that that kind of mixing across, like, different ethnic types of music and stuff. But, um, I mean, the tribalism, I think, for me, existed the most probably when I was a teenager growing up. And it was a lot about, like, how you looked and what you wore. But I feel like Instagram has really just changed that a lot because um, I think now when you look at people from my generation but also especially from the younger generations like Gen Z and stuff, like, you just see that it's more about kind of shape-shifting all the time and it seems like a lot of the... um, a lot of the kind of like fashion identities overlap so much more and you only have to look at like even the big fashion brands all looking to streetwear now and all employing like streetwear designers <coughs> to lead their fashion houses mm. it just shows you but i think that's also like a really important signal of how spending power has shifted and that also um reflects on how i think like DJing and club culture and people who are going to clubs and people who are playing music has shifted too because we're living in this really interesting time now where it's like the first time ever in history where um, ethnic minorities have been at this level of education, at this level of like wealth. Like it hasn't existed before. And you have big companies trying to tap into that. And I feel like Louis Vuitton employing Virgil Abloh, if you want to be totally cynical about it, probably was that because they wanted someone who would appeal to that demographic Mm -hmm. by their things but at the same time it's actually it feels quite empowering as well that when you go to for example a boiler room now or any kind of like big club in London or somewhere else that you do normally get a very mixed crowd Mm. and I know that people who listen to my like either the music I make or my or my DJ sets again is like really mixed and I appreciate that 
um, for example, because I'm a live artist as well. And when I played, when my last album came out and I was playing shows, I really noticed in the crowd that was this weird mix of like middle-aged white men who were probably coming because they liked they probably thought my guitar sound reminded them of like 80s guitar music but then there were loads of like young girls from you know who looked like around my age a lot of brown and black girls all down at the front at a gig and it just felt amazing because I hadn't really experienced that before and so these are all the positives I think that are coming out now and I think it's important to just remember that there's a lot of we're you know, hearing all of these stories about the past you know it's there's like a nostalgia around it and I love listening to Charlie and Colin and everyone saying these things but um when you talk about like tribalism and all of that yeah it still exists but also I feel like we're, we're at this time now where that exists less and that's a really important thing yeah, to I just mean, be proud of yeah a very interesting point so uh, let's talk about I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna get you involved don't worry but there's things I've got to cover here and one of them is we've talked about it a lot but let's I just want to kind of get into it a little bit which is about technology um Harold when you started DJing I'm imagining that you played vinyl, yeah, because that was the option, yeah. right? Yep, yep. Did you switch from vinyl to digital at some point? I did eventually. I was quite a late switcher. Uh, I was. I really loved my vinyl. Uh, you kind of develop a, quite an attachment to them. I'm assuming you like your vinyl too, right? Mm -hmm. You love your vinyl, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's quite an impractical. Uh, Format is very unreliable, you know, um, but yeah, I was quite a late switcher. And then when I did, I'd never look back. I love digital DJing. I think it uh, enables a DJ to work better, to do a better job of it, really. And so you don't, you left the vinyls behind? I left the vinyl behind. I've still That's got an enormous vinyl. vinyl connection. I can't uh, get rid of it. I love it too much. Yeah. And yet it's just... It's in storage. <laughs> I don't play it. You know? <laughs> It's did you then go and get the digital versions of everything that you had on record? I replaced quite a lot, yeah. But yeah. also, there's, you know, this, uh, that was during a period of this, uh, an increasing deluge of music anyway. So there's just so much. And how many times have you changed the, the, the way in which you, di you digitally DJ? Or just the once. Because I, I had a huge collection of CDs, and then eventually I switched to USB. So that to USB. So you carry a USB around. Yeah, yeah. And on the USB is what? An MP3, or is it a bigger file than an MP3? Uh, usually WAV files, yeah. WAV files, okay, which you purchase from yes, somewhere, absolutely. of course. Yeah. Um, Lene, you're no, nodding your head. Like CDs to um, WAV as well. CDs as well, okay. Um, if, if, if you go out to play a gig, do you, what do you bring with you? Do you bring vinyl? I do, especially in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like there's space for that. There are always CDJs or the USB situation and also decks. Um, and so that's helpful. And you say in the UK, is it unusual? I've noticed that there are clubs out there which don't have vinyl decks. Are you saying in other places they've just given they've given up on decks entirely? I mean, to, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, for sure. But also, I mean, I feel like with this the switch and the format, I mean, I've I've dealt with a serious kind of depression about the amount of music that is available to me now, right? It's just like, so that's why radio matters for me, is that, that I could actually sit with the music and listen and kind of create themes and different shows and, and really, you know, continue to pursue this intimate relationship um, with the music that I think technology threatens. Um, just the kind of mass production of, of the music. The Netflix movie I mean, scenario. Yeah, yeah. Like, how many <clears throat> songs can you carry on a USB? Like, we're talking about thousands of songs so i want that relationship so radio for me and with that yeah i use serato because it's really just about serato yeah i do i mean have you there is there was a weird transitional moment when the people were playing digital music but they were using these kind of black plastic things that looked like records so they could manipulate them right <laughs> have you guys all used that mm -hmm. you're all nodding colin have you I, used that I, I i um i know of the system but you didn't uh, but i didn't actually when did you make the switch did you make the full oh, switch, or are you still somewhere in between? No, no, I made a total switch, yeah. like, years ago. When I was working at KISS in the mid-'90s, they had the, the early um, variations of the CDJs there. So I, I've had access to digital since the mid-'90s, and I think it's probably about... 10 or 15 years ago I made a total switch and I've got tens of thousands of um, vinyl but I was saying to my girlfriend uh, the other day 
that I probably haven't played the record for the last five years, like put the stylus on the yeah. record. Mm. Yeah. But I've got a house full of records. Yeah. And um, for me, it's a real convenience thing as well. If I think of a record and a, um, a track and I want to play it, I can go wading through like hundreds of vinyl <laughs> or I can just... Surf. Call it up, I know. I... And that, that um, convenience is... is you know, re really good for me. It's not bad for the back either, is not it? Not bad I mean, for the back. Yeah, and yeah. occasionally, when I do pick up records, I remember how heavy they are. Uh, and it's, like, it's crazy so, talk, isn't it? So glad I don't. I know. I had this. I had this experience. Um, I bumped into a friend of mine, uh, Julius Judge Jules, who I, I sort of grew up with, and he was he was on his way to Ibiza to play like a four day residency, and I was like, well, you know, he was literally just, th and he's like, oh yeah, here's my set. And it was like on this Ubers thing here, well, yeah. and it was just a nightmare. Um, you're playing a vinyl only set tomorrow, is it? Or, or? Um, yeah. So is that yeah. is that something that you do almost as a kind of throwback, or as a why 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 vinyl? I I just like I played on all of the formats over the years, and I was a Serato beta tester, so I was one of the first yeah. people to ever DJ with a digital format in the club. And I did American I did American tour where the club owners were freaking out, <laughs> like. Where are your records? I don't understand. Like, you're unplugging the mixer. Like, what are you doing? I, like, you know, it was, that was like a, you know, baptism of fire. I just like playing records. Mm. And, you know, for me, I feel like it's a craft that needs to be maintained in a way that's open to people. So I'm not one of these old dudes who's like, oh, I only play vinyl. And if you're not playing vinyl, then you're not really a DJ. I'm like, that's just people, middle class dudes who've got too much money and rotary mixers sitting at home who don't really like their missus and they don't like the kids. So basically, I'm being sitting in the mean. I spend a lot of time on forums. So they spend a lot of time complaining about every other form of DJing other than what they do. Don't call it vinyls in that forum, yeah, by the way. Know, and I, I just like, for me, I don't have time for that because if you're a DJ... It's about sharing music with people and introducing people to mm. music and letting people know what the titles are because there's always going to be records. You know what I mean? That's why some of the rarest records I play, you know, people ask me what they are. I'm like, yeah, here you go. Mm. I'm always going to find something to top that. Mm. Um, but I, myself, personally, I like playing vinyl. I like it fits in with my yoga practice and running practice because it keeps me honest. So I don't run because I like running. I run because I want to be strong enough to carry my record box across We Out Here <laughs> because, you know, I'm not a superstar DJ, so I don't get the trolley like Tim Garcia. You know what I mean? So, you had the trolley? Yeah, he gets the trolley, man. <laughs> you know I mean? um, but I, I, just, I just like it. Yeah, and what I find, because with a lot of my audiences, you know, is you get kids who come up and they're really excited by the fact that I'm playing records and they're FaceTiming yeah. their mates, telling them, he's playing the record, he played the Ron Hardy record again, oh, my God. And they just kind of, they like that. And I like, you know... I think as you get older as a DJ, you have to start changing your relationship to it mm. and stop trying to pretend that you're 20 because you're not 20. <laughs> so you don't need to be doing thousands of gigs a year. You need to be in the right gigs. And I'm like, when I come up to the thing and there's, you know, need, there are DJs in USB, I'm like, wicked great. So there's four DJs on this build who are playing USB. I'll be the DJ that plays vinyl. Mm. I can play USB. I can play CDJ. I can play Serato. But let me be the one that plays vinyl so that at least the crowd who come can see the relation between you know the craft and how it's progressed and the different ways does it, do it does it change the kind of decision making like one of the things 100%. about being a vinyl only and i i'm a very very small time much smaller than harold dj weddings and funerals <laughs> pretty much bar mitzvahs uh, six coming up 60 year old birthday parties of friends and i don't know how to do the digital and i'm a bit short-sighted and i can't really do the fiddly bit but but one of the things that happens when you're preparing for a to go and play is you, you spend some time thinking about what am I going to put in the box and that really is a kind of important moment because you've limited your choices and the thing that kind of slightly scares me about the digital is that your choices aren't, haven't been sufficiently limited before you get into the club so you could play virtually anything so you have to make a lot of decisions you just have to put less tunes on your USB ah so, but yeah. is that, I bring out 200 because of that exact problem I don't yeah. want to have 2000 right. to pick from is that right me because many, it, too many presumably to there is a there is a way to grab it off digitally off the internet isn't there i mean presumably there are some people who are playing play the equivalent the of spotify you can play from the cloud where you could play virtually literally anything in the world yeah, but, but it do does choose when you've got how do you choose yeah, exactly yeah. yeah do you find that i mean is it i think you look well for me personally i, I the, the way i sort my records is really no different to how i would sort my digital records you, before a set you go through what you have and make a selection uh-huh 
And um, like Harold says, I don't go out with like 500 records to, to play a two hour set because you're going to spend all your time just going through them and um, second guessing so, yourself. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I limit it down to maybe 100. So, so on the subject, how close? Now, obviously, I'm going to assume here, and if, if I'm wrong, you can tell me, you would never program a set from beginning to end and stick to that, I would you? At the start. So you've, yeah, you've got your five start, records, your ten records. When you first start DJing. Oh, oh, I see. At the start of your career, you yeah, mean? Yeah. When I first started DJing, I would plan my set and practice it loads because like, I just wanted to make sure I was doing, getting it right and oh. I wanted to play. And I used to do that so much. But now I, don't, I never do that. <laughs> but I think also it's because like, the more you DJ, the more you, like, you know. You pick. There's like... Um, you can plan your set, but then actually the funnest moments where you don't plan it and then mm. you suddenly come up with a really good mix. You're like, oh, that works so well, and you'll remember it for next time. So it just depends. But obviously, if you're taking out vinyl, then you need to plan it a bit because you have to choose what records you want to take. Sure. But then this raises the other issue, which is that the DJ job, and this is separate perhaps from the DJ as radio DJ, because in some sense you're on your own, although you would hope there's someone listening. But the club DJ, you're not on your own. You can't be on your own. You are in a relationship, and that word has come up in your book, and you've talked about it as well, with the people on your floor, right? And things can change, right? If you've pre-decided what order you're going to do things, it can't, doesn't take account of the fact that there are human beings in front of you who are going to respond differently. How do you manage that, Lene, when you're, when you're playing? What, what kind of relationship do you build with an audience? Do you look at the audience? Do you... Oof. I mean, do yeah. you vibes with them in some way? Or how do you know if they're enjoying it? Short of them walking off, I suppose, that they could do that. I'm <laughs> right, not saying they would at one of your sets. That's set. an indication. <laughs> um, no, I think... you. So I rarely play out, right? Mm -hmm. Because I do feel like my relationship with the dance floor changed um, with... So something that I witnessed in New York was... Um, DJs playing songs for a shorter amount of time, right? So that it yeah. becomes almost like a medley, right? <laughs> right? And I'm like, damn, can we hear the chorus? Okay, right? Like, it's just like an expectation that we're moving through the music yeah. and creating a medley of, you know, familiar songs. Um, I think the, the, the break from that is playing for folks like, you know, in house music spaces where there's a different level of patience for a longer song. Um, and so that's where I prefer to spin if I spin out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm playing house, I'm playing techno because I feel like there's a range. They're not techno as much, but actually I'm playing disco, funk, soul, house um, and, and kind of having different conversations. Um, yeah, through, through that call and response situation. But I, I think that the pace of the dance floor has changed depending on where you are mm -hmm. because of how much access we have to the music and how much music we have. Mm -hmm. um, so... What do you guys think about the pace? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think when you when you play a lot with people who are playing on digital, right. they race through tunes, particularly people who use record box, right? Because they've already everything's key, you know, key mapped and BPM them up, and yeah. and that's cool. It's kind of exciting to watch. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I necessarily like doing as a DJ myself. And again, this is what I always say to like you know a lot of the younger DJs I mentor is, you know, you can change the type of DJ you are in your DJ career. And there are lots of different types of DJ that you can be. Mm -hmm. So you just you, you shouldn't just follow the one blueprint, you know, because everyone's, you know, lends their... Like, I can't, you know, when you get booked to go and play for an hour, I'm like, no, I don't want to do it because I can't even get warmed up, you know. Mm -hmm. My first record's got to be 15 minutes. It's like, this is going to work, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I... I, I, I and, and, but, again, in the 40-odd years I've been DJing, not once has anyone from the floor ever come up to the DJ booth and said, you should change that record because you're not playing it on vinyl. Or you should change that record because it's an MP3 and not a WAV. Mm. Or you should, you know, mm. alter the music in some way because the floor doesn't care. Doesn't care. They just want to be out there. You know, we're going through hard times at the moment and people want to come out. They pay their money, which they don't really have. They want to have, have a, a good time, time with their friends and... Yeah. I'm just helping to soundtrack your memories. Mm. Yeah. You know. That's and, a beautiful way of putting it. And Charlie. just give you a nice moment for you yeah. to kind of... Yeah, go on. That's it. Yeah, go on, go on. I'm going to ask one more question to, to you, and then we're going to throw it open to the floor. And I'm going to start with Colin, because um, not, not to sort of pick and choose or go hierarchies or anything, but you, 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 Colin, you've been DJing a long time, and you've had a, what looks like from the outside a, a successful DJing career. You've played all over the world. You've played... 
What kind of a job is being a DJ? Um, well, that, that, you know, the answer to this question is going to be different if you ask you yep. know, all five of us. Yep. But for me personally, when I got into it, I, I come from a generation of DJ where um, it wasn't a, a job as such or a career. It, it, it was, uh, for a lot of people of my generation, it was a hobby. And if you were lucky, it turned into, you know, some sort of form of employment. And um, so originally for me, it wasn't a job, but I found the longer that I went on um, doing it, it became more like a job. Because once I, well, I found this, once you get to a certain level, to stay at that level, you've got you've got to work really hard um, to stay there, which is why I've got a lot of respect, lots of, you know, people like Charlie and and our friends here that keep doing it for years and decades even. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's very much a job. It's not an easy job. It's a job that's got lots of different uh, things that you have to do. It's it's definitely not just standing there and playing records. That's, you know... No, but let me... let me the end Let me bl- be, bl- be sort of not blunt about it, but let me mm. put it like this. I remember you telling me, that, and, and I put it in my book because it was touched me so much, you know, when it took off, you, I think, worked in a bank. Groove Rider worked in a bank or an accountant. And, you know, you were able to give that up. Now, had you stayed in that job, you would have had, you know, a, a mortgage, car and a family and, you know, the stability mm. that goes with having that kind of thing. Yeah. Has DJing allowed you to have that? And I'm not saying that's necessarily what you want, but has it given you that stability? I mean, I presume there's uh, no de- pension. Definitely, definitely not given me the stability. I mean, for, for me personally, I can go through stages where I have too much work and then a month later I, I haven't got any work. So th- that can happen. So it's definitely not... Um, un- unless you're at a certain level, um, consistent level... Um, um, it's, it's, it's just a lot of hard work to sustain that, yeah. that level. Yeah. And, and primarily because there are so many DJs out there. Too many I mean, DJs. That word DJ, yeah. it's a word that's so easily bandied around now. And um, it wasn't like that when we were starting mm. out. Only people that were really dedicated went out and bought the decks and the records mm. and, and stayed in their bedrooms so and expensive. played for months and months and months. Um, would call themselves a DJ, where people, you know, yeah, it's just an easy title to use nowadays. So DJs need to sort of do other things as well. I mean, not only is DJing more than just playing records, and there's mm. lots of, other, but DJs do other things. Charlie's been in a band. Mm. Harold, you, you're a writer. Were you always a writer while you were DJing? Was no, it? DJing definitely came first. Um, but you're right; it is a very strange job. It's a combination of many different roles. It's part shaman, part children's entertainer, part technician, do you know what I mean? It's many, many different things. Part relationship counsellor to a whole room, you know. It's a, a bizarre... Relationship counsellor to a whole room, what a nice yeah, way of putting I mean, it. For real. <laughs> so the writing, I mean, you're now, uh, it appears quite a busy journalist, I mean, you, yeah, yeah. and you've written a book. Yeah. Um, was that because you wanted to supplement your income, or is it because it was part of the same It was because I wanted to work in music, and uh, my DJing career had dried up. Uh, my productions were selling like 10, 15 copies over a year kind of thing, you know, and you spend a few days working on a production and then a year later you get 15 quid for it kind of thing, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it was just a way of staying within that music culture but just doing something else, and it turned out I was, I was quite good at it. Yeah, yeah mm. indeed you are. And the here, I mean, it's quite tough. One of the things about DJing is you have, you know, the, the, the late nights... Yeah. The proximity to drugs and alcohol and kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. Yep. I actually don't... I've never drank and I've never taken drugs, so I'm kind of the odd one out. Uh, like people are always like, you're a rider. It only says water. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it's true. <laughs> but, but you, you are in like environments where... the only drug you really need. Uh-huh. If, you're, if you, the music's good and you're with your friends and you're having a good time, what else do you need? I feel like when you don't have that, that's when people try and overcompensate with other things. But really, I don't know. I mean, I've never done it, so I don't know what it feels like to like take a pill or something. But I just know that I've felt amazing from just listening to music and dancing and being with my mates. That's a beautiful sentiment. That's a beautiful sentiment. <laughs> let's, um, let's open this up now to people who might want to ask questions or make comments or don't feel shy. Just let us know how you're feeling. Listen, Colin Dale is on the panel. <laughs> Colin Dale is on the panel. I only did this because they, like, they were like, 
Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> not be like Colin Dale. Like, oh my God! No way! <laughs> not because of me. No, no, no. no. <laughs> not because of Nabia. Not because of the name. <laughs> that was there, but <laughs> have you? you know. We'll we'll leave them. Do you have your hand up, or are you just gesturing? Sorry. Okay. Yes, we've got a question here. Uh, uh, all I'm going to say is, I am never someone who, in front of people, who has a comment. I always have to question. <laughs> I am so stuffed with the knowledge and the love and the experience that you've given at the moment. My heart, and I'm like, I want to talk about the whole thing about the house, because I'm from a Jamaican background. And Saturday, James, about everything. Yeah. So, um, all the different things that you've, you've mentioned. But I think what I want to do is, is sort of add another layer, I suppose, to it in that. What concerns me as someone who's a former journalist is what's been lost because I um, uh, have noticed there was a lot of women who were DJs when I was growing up and promoters and so on. And they did different things like they, you know, they were, um, you know, they worked in diversity or worked in a local council, whatever, were nurses, you know, they did some bits of uh, ministry. And, and yet, you know, there's, there's a risk, you know, like you say, intergenerational panels of that being lost. Also, the role of um, women at home and of why we had parties, because I grew up and I, my love of music came from going to parties, um, not just weddings, but everyone was having a house party. There was so, the sound system um, all through school, um, all through my life, um, including at my home, um, where you'd have, I don't even know how they did it, you had adults in one room, dancing and then they had their own music we're in another room and it's rigged up so we had our music um where is that information you know um and there seems to be a revival going on because i hear you and this goes back um charlie what you said earlier on about low hanging fruit because i i feel that there's a lot of um music lovers people want to go out and sweat and dance and the djs aren't meeting their needs mm. also the fact that um I know that um, there's alternative nights that are being set up now because people are getting frustrated with this sort of like rush through the music, that lack of love. You know when you watch mm. MasterChef and people get pissed off saying, why are you decimating that carrot? Yeah. <laughs> 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 carrot some love and respect. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that, that what's, what, what is actually is happening, the people are playing out vinyl. I mean, I know someone called DJ Yanit, um, y Yinka, she didn't yeah. get name on, Yinka, who, again, you know, works in a completely different unrelated sector, DJ for years doing disco, stopped doing it, got her husband into it, it's actually his favourite, isn't it? Mm. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, they, 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 they play, they set up their own night, yeah. several sessions in Notting Hill, playing vinyl, and sometimes they didn't have both decks working, people were patient. Yeah. And they loved it, you yeah. know? And, um, and so, and in the night's doing so well. Um, and so what I'm saying is that and I think, you know, you've all alluded to it, particularly on Charlie, that, that this, um, and David Simon, you know, the, the, you know, broke the wire and everything else. Yeah. Stop treating your consumer like a stupid. We yeah. are so seasoned, we're so informed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And especially in, the, in Britain. Yeah. You know, because like you're saying about, because I'm 57 now, and, and, the, and the love of music, the type of music that we grew up with, the eclecticism, yeah. um, and that diversity. So, sorry, so that's a statement, yeah. overview. A everything. comment, <laughs> question, <laughs> statement. But, but yeah. I do think that, you know, because and the fact that you all left a, a, a big, a, you know, you're current, but you also are, are living legends. Um, how, what do you think needs to happen so we actually don't have a bit of nonplussed yeah. um, people around when we're stating what we know and uh, may probably most probably leave with us? Um, yeah. Thank you. That's a, a lovely question. I don't know if who wants to take that. It feels like, Lene, it feels like part of your project is mm -hmm. addressing precisely mm -hmm. what we just heard there. Yeah, I mean, because I guess in conversation with the question you asked about what the work is, uh, for me, um, the work began with digging through, well, really chasing samples, right? So chasing samples, which led to digging through the crates and then kind of having this intergenerational conversation realizing how Public Enemy was sampling James Brown and, and just kind of thinking about, again, the social conditions under which the music was created, um, studying album covers, reading liner notes, and then realizing I've developed a methodology, right? Um, a way of kind of understanding, and for me, the focus has been, you know, black music globally, and, and sharing that information um, for me through the syllabus, Right and kind of partnering with cultural institutions and academic institutions and bringing 
what I'm calling DJ scholarship into, um, you know, academia and having students think about erasure, the, you know, the erasure of, of black women in the conversation about the emergence of house and techno and how we can have full conversations about house and techno and really not think about the role that women play in developing it. And especially when you're thinking about techno in Detroit and the ways in which women's voices were removed from the sort of sonic signature um, of techno, right? Um, and so I think chasing those stories, so for me, the work is um, recuperative, right? It, is, it really is about, um, it's archival. It's trying to kind of be in conversation with the ghost, right? Um, who occupy both the dance floor and the speakers, right? That, and try to name them and then try to teach those names to young people. I think um, there needs to be more intergenerational conversations, more in more spaces that welcome an intergenerational dance floor. Uh -huh. You know, and we learned that from reggae because that's what the reggae dance floor, the you know, yeah. that was a f cross generational. And there's yeah. such a good reggae night that's really intergenerational. I played it a few weeks ago at Walthamstow Trades Hall. Yeah. I don't know if anyone knows it, and it's called General Echo, and it was one of the most fun experiences because it's in this really time warped like hall, like an old working men's club, and the crowd was super mixed, mm -hmm. and you had all these old school people that were like rude boys from like the old generations who were there there was one woman on a walking stick on the dance floor which i've never seen before <laughs> loving all the tunes but then also loads of young people and it was just the best feeling so mm. it does exist i think you just have to like maybe yeah. search it out yeah. harder one thing that you were touching on which is something which has popped up recently uh, via a um someone tweeted it i think uh tweeted a purported fact which was that there two nightclubs are closing every minute in the UK. Is this something, Harold, that we should be worried about? Is it something that oh, concerns man. you? Their own fault. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I mean, clearly, nightclubs are in a terrible uh, fix at the moment. Um, I think that because of the reputation of dance music as being something close to crime and drugs, we don't get the support for our culture that we should get. That other, you know, the opera, for example, there's been a story in the news this week. You're all there up in arms about the e cutting the ENO funding, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, yes, is the short answer. I what do you think, Charlie? You're well, my thing is, I was saying this to my son recently, and I was like, look, son, I was like saying to him, look, we've got to understand, going to fabric is the equivalent of me going to Hippodrome back in the day. There's nothing cutting edge about going to these super clubs. <laughs> and so I think what's happened is we've been kind of brainwashed in a way, because a lot of people from our generation were not writers, we were curators. Hmm. So the stories are not documented thoroughly, and they're, document they're very one-sided documentation. <laughs> So at the moment, you have this thing where it's kind of people really like, like right, whatever resident advisor, whatever mix mag, whatever DJ magazine, whatever they're saying, that is the Bible. Mm. And actually what they're really reporting on is a lot of stuff that's really super mainstream. Mm. So I think there's a kind of like responsibility of the, you know, because no one's forcing you to go to these places. But it requires you to just, in some ways, kind of take your research back to the old school days where it's like, oh, they're telling me I should go to this? You know what, I'm going to go to this because this is a bit more interesting, you <laughs> yeah. know. Um, I mean, one tries not to be nostalgic, but the club culture I think that I grew up on, that you grew up on, that you grew up on, was a club culture where those mainstream clubs you didn't want to go anyway. Yeah. It, where there was a race quota. Yeah. The sounds weren't good. The music wasn't good, and there was. But what there was was a lot of empty space that could be re, yeah. you know, changed the warehouse party thing. Now the problem is the privatization of space has happened to such a degree that it's very, very hard to find that, on the one hand. On the other hand, Nabiha, are there still... I feel like... Is there still spaces around? Yeah, yeah. and actually, it's, it's not even necessarily about, oh, like, the actual physical nightclubs closing down, so this means that there's no more light, nightlife. Because it's really easy to fall into that hole, but things have been closing down forever, gentrification has been happening forever, we're in London, but what is the thing that makes London, London, what attracts people to this city, what keeps people here? It's the energy and the creativity of the people, which it doesn't matter what's happening in terms of buildings closing down, you can never stop that. You can never stop the drive, the urge to like have a party, to create a dance floor, to create a space to listen to music together, that's always gonna happen. And, and 
So people forget that like DIY is an option, you know, because when I first started DJing and like even performing, all the parties were ones that I'd put on myself with mm. friends. And it's because like when you're just starting out and no one knows who you are, obviously a bigger club's not going to be like, yeah, here you go, Saturday night, take it over. <laughs> They're not going to do yeah. that. But like, like I said, we started off by doing parties in laundrettes and I put on like a big party inside an old library by... Leicester Square and we put a big Function One system in there and just like applied for a late license and did it all I, that one I did it all myself but it was rammed and it was so fun and sometimes I feel like in the social media internet age you forget like actually real life things you've got to do it yourself, you've got to make it happen you've got to do and it that yourself will never that, die. Is right. never that is right we've got a question here, yes please <laughs> the MOBA Awards, Music of Black Origin Awards, announced um, electronic and dance music as a, yeah. as a new category. Wow. And it's <laughs> late in the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, exactly. Like that. And, you know, techno house um, music is black music. Yeah. Mm. And Absolutely. I think that's a point I just want us to, to, to want people to, to take in, because I think people um, forget that this music genre was born out of a, a form of resistance. Mm. resistance to sexual sexual and racial terrorism that was taking place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I guess my thought slash question is of, around maybe the distribution of labor mm. and maybe some of the ownership structures because when I look at, when I go to raves, I've been raving since I was about 15. I'm from South London. You know, like I, I the music, everything you're saying is like, I, I, you know, these things that resonate with me. It's not just something cool to do. It's, it's who we are, it's culture. Mm. It's a language, you know. If you want to understand black people, listen to our music. Listen to the hip-hop, listen to the reggae, listen to the soul, listen to the house. And it's, it, is a, it has a purpose. So for me, I want to know how important it, it is um, ownership. Ownership and uh, being able to curate these, um, these spaces. Because it seems now, if I go to a festival, if I go to a rave, this music is being played, but all of the DJs are young, white, middle-aged uh, young guys. Mm. You know, and it's like, where are, where are the black DJs? I, I mean, it's, it's always been that way. And that's something that people have to understand. <laughs> this isn't a new thing, you know. It's always, always been that way. I had a really amazing conversation with Norman Jay. And he was like, you know, telling me what it was like when he first started DJing and why he set up good times and started doing things himself. <laughs> I think there's always this hope that you think the landscape's going to change. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know... What, one of the things I encounter is a lot of the times the people who are now the bookers for festivals, owners of clubs, promotion AGs, they're young themselves. They haven't been part of community. They've, got in, they've accessed to music in a very different way in the way that we've accessed to music. So a lot of times, you know, they don't, they don't know who any of these people are. And they don't understand why. And when you, you know, as an older person, when you're like, oh, man, if you're into techno, you need to go Google Colin Dale. They're like, all right, cool, wicked, great. I'm going to go to YouTube. Okay, I'm going to put boomer. Colin, I'm going to put Colin Dale in, and there's going to be like 10,000 things are going to come up. So it's where do I start? And again, this is this thing that I say is a lot of times is kind of we don't have the spaces where you can actually educate people, pass on knowledge, because there's almost this idea amongst music at the moment, like if you don't know, because the internet exists, if you don't know about something to its utmost degree, then you're not doing it the right way. And actually, I think it's just a thing of like, if you've grown up with the internet, then you don't really necessarily know about research because mm. it's kind of a bit, you know... It's the first five. Google first five. That come up. So you put the first five techno in, my man's name's not coming up. You know what I mean? If you put... My, my name's not coming up. So, but my thing is this, this is how it's always been. You can spend five days getting vexed about it mm. or you can just be like, you know what? I'm going to go and do my own thing. And if DJ Mag or all of these other people are not talking about it, cool, wicked, because that means I'm doing something proper and underground. One thing that has happened or is happening is that there is a generation of black music makers <clears throat> who are starting to be interviewed, to write, to teach. Uh, the, the, more, is this, do you think, so the name, more, more than has been the case up to now, I mean, in terms of finding some spaces within the inst white institutional structures to sort of speak their minds and um yeah. i mean so this is deeply personal for me thinking about 
house music and techno in particular in the south side of Chicago and Detroit and south central LA and Compton um, and also in Johannesburg and and thinking about again the conditions that black people are facing while creating the music and so in terms of the political economy of black music that's existed for centuries I just have questions about whether or not you love black music and hate the conditions under which it's made hmm. right um so that you are maybe thinking differently about if you are white the gigs that you agree to right play um and maybe like using your platform to talk about this very <laughs> important question about exploitation or the fact that you know next door to detroit flint michigan didn't have clean water but the edm <laughs> right cloud of influence is a multi-billion dollar like force uh, so i'm trying to figure out how to have this conversation um and 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 push us away from like thinking about like, that's why i'm just like what what does this mean for our sort of material existence right Be, it's it's so i don't even just want to see black djs i'm looking at every year forbes magazine does a top 15 richest dj oh goodness this just, year it was oh yeah oh like <laughs> my friend Jules was on it but if I was maybe number one or so what but like what are room. some of those numbers and who like what uh, no they were all white they were all white guys they were like 50 all million of them. a year they were all middle class they were all apart from Steve Aoki was on it I guess yep. so he's mm, Calvin Harris of course Cal of course right? yeah so. and it yeah, yeah yeah so I guess I mean there are ways you know there are so many things to be said here one of them is the the operation operating the idea of the underground in some kind of way like recognizing that there was always as you said Charlie the main a mainstream which carried the weight of you know the white supremacist sexist violent you know drunken culture that we kind of grew up in uh, and black music came to us via an underground, didn't it? It was the currents of pirate radio. It was the, the, mm. the circuits of independent record stores. It was carried in memory and knowledge, and it was shared almost as a kind of secret knowledge, mm. uh, linked with what Nabi, Nabi has said about, you know, DIY. It's like not expecting that it, all of the well, formal spaces... I'm saying be. DIY as a way of reacting to that, like if you haven't sure. got your own space, but that doesn't mean that... I think we should be stuck in DIY because we mm. can't get into get the mainstream access, and, sure. and access. Mm -hmm. But the, the point is that all these people, whether it's like the Forbes 15 richest DJs or people who run labels like Ireland or whatever else, they, why would they want to give up their position? Of course they don't. They're mm. the gatekeepers. They're the richest. They control the music industry. Why would they be like, you know what? It's 2022. It's time for the black and brown people to take over. Of course they're not going to be like that because no one would. But all of these things need to change and it's just about how to change it so that point someone made uh, yeah that you were making about the industry like what's the makeup of the industry and the, the truth is that when you look at p when people have conversations about we need more diversity in music they'll be thinking about artists and djs and oh we need three more females on this festival lineup otherwise we're going to get cancelled or whatever you know and it is like just for optics really because when you look on the flip side of that and actually the industry who runs the labels who runs management who runs agencies it's all yeah i know white men basically there's a question up there but before we get there i'm gonna get, i just want to ask harold one thing as we're, we're both sitting here as white blokes yep. involved in black music so there is there is an ethical orientation here describe do you agree with me about that in the sense that you have to be aware you know you you have to be aware as a white person who's involved yeah, I in mean, black music how do you think it's as through a, that as a 12 13 year old kid getting into electro and hip hop it wasn't an issue for me right no. um but now very clearly it is and yeah i'm a very aware of my place you know i'm a i'm a white middle class heterosexual male the world was made by men like me for men like me and i've pretty much cruised through my life in a way that others have not been able to others haven't yeah. you know what i mean so yeah you have to be aware of that it's uh well, and it's it, the most important thing actually the self-awareness because you can't talk you know like some people are like all men are the same or this and that you can't do that because it's mm. not true and so you have people with that level of awareness and when i think about the people that have helped me the most so far in my career it's white middle-aged men honestly and but it's people who have that kind of self-awareness and who see me and believe in me and i'm so grateful to, to that mm -hmm. and we just need more of that i think and we just need more of people who aren't the status quo trying to get into the industry and trying to 
it's going to take a long time. It's not an overnight thing no, at no. all, but... Yes, please, at the back. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank Still you. available, presumably, some way, somehow. I don't know. <laughs> Stru go stream it. So, um, the, uh, the anecdote is uh, Colin. Um, so it's a classic radio moment with um, Dave Marvison. And uh, you were playing a record, and you mentioned the artist. And uh, you just pronounced the artist the way you normally did. And Dave Marvison came up on the air and said, uh, Colin, actually, it's not actually pronounced this way. Say anything, you know, and you said to him, Dave, you didn't want to say anything. You, said, on <laughs> <laughs> you remember that from way back in the day. Wow. Wonderful comment. Okay, there's, there's one up here, and then I'll come down here. Thank you. Yep. Uh, So lovely question, lovely question. Who wants to take that? <clears throat> I'd say just being authentic is the best thing you can do. It's like you can think, oh, wait, maybe I should play this kind of music because I haven't heard anyone play it, but you need to be into it. I just feel like in anything creative, whether it's like a fashion designer or a musician or a DJ or an artist, like if you're not doing something you don't, that you don't believe in, it's never going to last because people will see through it. So whatever music you think you want to hear and you want to share with people, that's what you've got to follow. And that's the thing that will last. That's what I'd say. I think one of the biggest advice I'd say is to young DJs is don't become obsessed about the mix. <laughs> yeah. Because the mixing part is such a small part of the craft. And so you get a lot of, you know, DJs now who are just, you know, they're like, I can't play because I can't mix. I'm like, I say, you know, I'm going to say selection. Mm. beats mix skills Ooh. any day of the week mm. because I've heard a lot of boring DJs who can mix impeccably <laughs> but the selection is just mm. boring yeah. mm. and I've heard a lot of DJs who can't mix for Toffee yeah. but they're just excited because you just yeah. don't know what's going to come next yeah. and, those yeah. are the, uh, and dancers can handle it this is yeah. the thing, the idea is if you do a bad mix or if it doesn't quite fit they will, the dancers will rush off the dance floor or boo you or something. But actually, as we know from the reggae dance, it's like they can even wait for a bit. There can be a bit of silence in there. It's all right. It's OK. Yeah, so, I, you know, that's the right Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. Anyone else want to respond to the young man up here? There's two. Yeah, there's two. OK, let's go. We've got a question here. Yes, please. I mean, I feel like you've been saying that like the Charlie Cameron simulation. I know. Like, I mean, of course he can. <laughs> he just doesn't choose to all the time. <coughs> to go to the house party that was the yeah. communication reason but really i mean i think what's changed is, is radio because that's how we were able to connect with the dj if he even couldn't go to the house party mm. and listening to them talk about the mix or talk about how they got the record that was yeah. that was how our society stayed alive in recession or in depression or in violence because you remember while they were coming up i mean you said all the technology so my question then is how do we, I wouldn't say recreate it, how do, you know, that connection that you had where you had to 
listen. I think we, we as the thing, not just on the dance floor, but listen on the radio or listen in the record shop. That listening is gone. And that listening is a very important part. We almost forget the importance of DJ. And I guess my question to these DJs is, how do we get that listening back for the DJ? Mm, very, very interesting point. Yes. I mean, um, I totally agree with what you're saying, but I, I think a big... Um, um, problem that we have t um, in in this whole music thing. We even uh, spoke about it when we were uh, talking about the quick mixing of that, and that is um, short attention span. Um, it's a big problem, mm -hmm. and and uh, I think that's a big problem. You know, people trying to squeeze in too much into. And surely, social media has got to take some some Absolutely. blame for that. Digital culture. Absolutely. How many browser windows Absolutely. have you got open at any one time? Yeah. You know, how many things are you doing? I mean, radio still exists, you know, but it's just the audience has been so dispersed. I mean, you know, when I growing up with Kiss FM, I mean, Kiss FM, everybody in London was listening to Kiss FM yeah, all at the same time, right? It felt great, you know, to be honest. And it's it's been really weird to see the shift from there being um, four or five pirate stations and a very small access to, to black music to what we have now where literally anyone can go and start a radio station, get a few friends together if they want. So there's a massive, um, shift, massive shift on that front. Yeah. I mean, my thing is always, like, I like nostalgia, but I don't let it run my life. Mm. So my thing is, as a DJ, if I think back to the DJs who first influenced me, you know, Cool Herc, Red Alert, kind of, you know, froggy hip-hop DJs, once they discovered the f that moment, like, this break in this record is going to hold the attention of the dance floor, and then that became a thing. So I'm like, you know, if I go out and rave with the 20-year-olds, and it's like chorus, half of the first verse, into the next record, I'm actually okay mm. with it, because in that moment, that's what feels right. Mm. Mm. And when I look around the room, and there's 200 people, 300 people, and they're loving it, yeah. I'm like, you know what, this is kind of cool. As a DJ, let me go home and spend a week practicing to mix in this way. Mm. So at least I have that skill underneath my belt, you know, before I dismiss it. Because mm. I think there's a lot of, like, you know, I'm 52. There's, there's, a lot a, of there's old fogey problems. Yeah, yeah just yeah, like, yeah. basically, as soon as something happens that they can't do mm. or is a bit alien to what they've grown up with, then suddenly it's like they dismiss it. Mm. And this is what I think is causing the cavern and division amongst the DJs, mm. where basically it's like... You know, my son, he's just getting into DJing. Is he buying records? No. Is he about to inher inherit 20,000 records? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Is he happy about that? Not necessarily so. Because he sees that as every time we move house, it's a big chore. Yeah. Mm, right? yeah, they take yeah, up an incredible amount of room. Yeah. When I go out with my dad on the weekends, I just want to spend time with my dad. But he's got to stop and talk about a record that he made 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's very different for him. So when I see him and he's in the mix and he's playing, you know whatever crazy stuff he's playing and, and the mix is flowing. I'm like, you know what? This is really interesting. Because mm. if I was your age, if I was 15, I'd probably be doing it that way too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that is one of the things that I think has also got to change. And, you know, the negativity is, is a repetition of what, you know, the old codgers would have thought of hip-hop. In fact, what they did think about hip-hop. What are you doing in my record? Why are you scratching it? Why are you mixing it My together? band was called Attica Blues because I went into Soul Jazz when they were in Camden you saw that and they kicked me out. out. Because I was basically, I had pumas, fat laces, and big baggy trousers. And they said to me, you can't afford the record that you've asked about. And that's why my band is called Attica Blues. Lovely story. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's always been a reaction. For me, DJing has always been about rebellion. Finding your voice. You know what I mean? It's kind of... And that matches the music, though. I think we've talked about that that has got that edge. Thank you. Yes. Um, isn't it kind of been touched on? I feel like I... mentioned at the beginning that the DA should get in people for a love of music and that's being lost. And I kind of feel like when I go out now sometimes, and I'm more in the mainstream clubs, that I kind of feel like a lot of DJs just don't take risks. Like you kind of just go in there knowing what the songs are going to be. Like you hear the same Drake song, you hear the same album, <laughs> album, all that stuff. And I kind of feel like DJs, you know, as lovers of music, of course, make sure everyone is, you know, hyped and enjoying themselves, but there should be um, things to educate and enrich the audience's listening palette and listening taste. But do you think that's still the case now? Or mm. 
Mm. I think one of the things that's hard now is you've got people who run clubs and put parties on who don't actually like music. Mm. And they have the power. So a lot of times, we probably all had this, where you go and you know you've absolutely killed it. But when you read about the set afterwards, or you talk to promoter afterwards, they're kind of being a bit like that you didn't really bring the ruckus. Mm. So I think that's because of that, what happens is people don't want to take risks. Because actually, there are so many DJs, there's not enough bookings, there's not enough good clubs. So a lot of people go in just like, I just want to get rebooked for next week. You mean, I just want to get rebooked. So I'll play whatever I need to play in order to get the Instagram moment, mm. which ensures that the wider world thinks that I'm a better DJ than I actually am. Because <laughs> yeah. it is really, if you look about the clips, it's all about the drop. Mm. And as I always say to people, it's easy to get a crowd to go wild when you're playing music with sub bass. Mm. Yeah. On a digital system that's been designed for it. Mm. It's much harder when you're playing, you know, one of, you know, you might bring out one of your obscure Peruvian, you know, disco <laughs> records <laughs> come out, stuff like that. But what I mean Which was made before sub bass existed, yeah. right? It's so it's not down at that below 60 love, hertz. Yeah, they do love it. But yeah. I think a lot of DJs, what happens is... You get nervous, you don't want to play it because you'll be like, oh, what if no one's... Well, gonna... that's a really interesting point, isn't it? And you always right, forget right. that actually there is a way in which you can reset mm -hmm. by just turning everything off. And when you start it up again, you're no longer competing <laughs> with... Yeah. This is my method of DJing, by the way. Just stop it, you know. You'll be hearing me later. I'll just stop the record and then put another one on. But this does relate to this kind of role. Let, just to bring it all the way back, it relates to this idea of your, your role as a DJ, yeah, which absolutely. is to get people dancing, you, let's say, and, and to, people to have fun, but it's more than that. There, you've yeah. got a responsibility to the music yes. in a way, haven't Certainly, you? Certainly, but I, but I also, just to combine these questions, um, listening does matter mm. to the art form. And I think the critique of the pace um, is connected to a distance in the listening. Um, because I do think, or can be, I should mm. say, um, because I am someone who can just, oh, you just want me to like cut and like drop before the chorus? I can do that. But I'm also interested in listening um, and taking a risk and kind of um, developing a sonic signature, which I feel like I feel like I learned that from selectors, right? And like thinking through um, what it means to have this rapport with the dance floor and for them to expect a sound coming from you and not necessarily an artist where it becomes like product placement for corporate music companies, right? So I do think listening matters. Um, and then in terms of my work, what was your question? Sorry. Oh, no, it wasn't a question. It was a cool. comment. It was, about, it was just about the, the responsibility that you have to... Yeah. One of the things in the quote that we used to promote this thing was about the DJ being a knowledge expert, really. Yeah. Someone who carries the knowledge mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, like a university lecturer or, or mm -hmm. a parent or so, anyone whose mm -hmm. job is the, you're trying to pass things on. Yeah. Presentation, performance, trust between the DJ and the dance floor, but the idea of what the DJ is doing off the dance floor matters as well, right? Digging through the crates. Digging the crates. And presenting. And it's not always fun digging the crates, is it? Absolutely I mean, it's dusty. Not. Well, I mean, it's digging the... Expensive. How do you dig digital crates? So, what's that all about? How do you do? You just you're just scrolling through stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not always fun, but it can be quite thrilling getting into the digging, right? Yeah. Going through that mouldy stuff there. Yeah. Um, let me just see. Well, We've got one here. We, yes. yes Talk about the here. digging I, thing. We've got one here. Sorry, were you? I, I can't I see very well. Ages ago, oh, I'm so sorry. So. It was a while back. Okay. But <laughs> let's, <laughs> oh, you might. Have. <laughs> We've got the space now. We can have a bit of a moment, and then we can listen. where like in a big city as diverse as London where you would assume that you go to like a black music night or like go to the studio that there would be more like different types of relationships. More diverse but dance floor. I just I find it quite wild, especially since I grew up in London, but that's not really the case. Mm. And I'm just wondering like what would kind of happen in the music scene that there isn't that organic interaction between different types of cultures. Mm, that's an interesting point. Oh, that's an interesting point. I yeah. mean, mm. people what do we think? Festivals have smashed yeah. the thing up. Mm. Is it, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Like, course, I feel I love Corsica Studios, but the crowd does always seem kind of the same. But I'm so glad it still exists. It just depends. So, for me, like, this is something I really think about, and also a lot of these themes of like share 
sharing music, helping other people who've got who I think have really good music taste or really good music. So I put on my own series of events called Glory to Sound, and I started it in 2018. And some of them are talks, some of them are live music events. Then we also do loads of different club nights, you know. And at those ones, we have a super diverse crowd every single time. And um, I don't know whether it's because, like, you know, like in this kind of piecemeal way, I've, like, built up a bit of a following and all of these people, they come to those nights and it's so mixed. And when when I do one of those events, and normally I'll be hosting or I'll play a bit, but it's really for other people to play at, um, it just feels good and it is mixed. So maybe they, these things do exist, but they're a bit more niche and perhaps, like, on a smaller scale because the club that I do those nights in, it's only 150 capacity. Mm. So they let me do it there, but... Mm. I'm so grateful for it because it's always a beautiful crowd. But maybe you need to come. To I just <laughs> we've got time for. I, I will allow you to make a final comment, but we've, we've got time for one more question. Just up here. Oh, yeah, you know you, 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 you. Okay. yeah. Hi, thank you. So um, I'm very curious about the way you're languaging, like the way you're talking about your practices as DJs, which makes me think a lot about how the somatic response to sound and vibration. Which now I'm interested in, particularly because you spoke about his, um, histories and cultures of extraction, yeah. and how you know. I mean, even when you speak about music, you're saying black music, and rather than music made by black people, but it's extracted and made global without the benefit of black people benefiting from that, you know, that that culture. So I'm interested about to hear about your ancestral ear, like how do you listen yeah. ancestrally in this timeline to create the narrative of what is your practice. So the question is really like, what is your narrative? What is it that you're saying as a storyteller through music when you put on your ancestral ear on the ground wow. and on the celestial plane? Oh. Yeah. All right. Now, what we're going to do, I'm going to hear from everyone on this. <laughs> uh, everyone's going to have a, uh, something to say on this, I think. Uh, there's, that's a deep question. You brought us to celestial plane. We've got ancestral. And we're going to go with whoever wants to start. Do it in order. Yeah, let's start with Lene. Come on. Oh, yeah. We're going to start with Lene. Come on, Capricorn. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> Horns on. How do you listen ancestrally and what's the time like that? First of all, brilliant question. Great question. Brilliant. Um, okay. Um, yeah, that ancestral, that ancestral listening takes me to different places, right? And it's important because I'm hearing folks talk about how much they love and have been shaped by black American music, we have not had the same experience, right? Where we have not had the same access to black British music. We have not had the same access to Caribbean, right? We've not had the same access. So when I started listening to jungle, when I started listening to, you know, South African jazz, when I started listening to music from Zimbabwe, I started hearing myself, different echoes of myself. So the listening, my ancestral listening is like an echo chamber of connection um, between me and black folks globally. The stories that I'm telling, which is really interesting, ends up being a sort of close listening to the voices of women, which is something that's sort of removed from the dance floor. <laughs> like just the voices of women. So I'm, I listen to women across the diaspora. And I'm just curious about, you know, I, what it means to listen to African women musicians, how, how rarely we hear them, certainly how I pretty much never heard them in the States, how I rarely heard Jamaican women, how I rarely heard South African women. So my listening is connected to wanting to know how women, right, have articulated song and dance. Beautiful, thank you. Harold? Um, I can't really follow that, to be Well, honest. you can. Yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. But, I mean, how, how does that land with you, that question, and how do you... Can we ask the question again, please? Do you uh, mind? Well, it's about ancestral listening. It's about history. It's about how you put it together in a story that you're then passing on. Yeah. How do you relate that? You know, it's part of... Be, you're part of the story as well. I mean, maybe you think about ancestry slightly differently than Lene might hear. I don't yes, know. Yes, I do. I mean, these, I've got to say, again, as a white middle-class man, it's not, you know, these are issues that I haven't perhaps engaged with perhaps as much as the other people on this panel. I feel like a, almost like an intruder on a, a line of history kind of thing. Not quite an intruder because I love it as much as anyone. Uh -huh. But also it's not my history. Mm. But also it kind of is part of my history because 
I've been in this thing. For, it's made you. Um, surely it's years. gone into making you who you are or being part of something. Yeah, that you've so it's a tricky question. I guess I feel like an interloper in someone else's history that I also secretly think is a little bit my history, but I know it isn't, right? <laughs> But your That's history a, is your history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's complex. I mean, just like, of course, it's a subset of a much larger com complex relationship with, that white people have to have with yeah. white supremacy and, Indeed, you know, and the privilege yeah. that, that we've accrued through it. So thank you. I think that's a really honest and beautiful response. Colin. <clears throat> Um, fantastic question, by the way. Um, fantastic. Very deep question. I had to give it a lot of thought. <laughs> and um, I mean... I don't consciously, I'll be totally honest, I don't think I've ever listened to music with a conscious ear of it being connected with any past ancestral... I'll be totally honest. I mean, I know there's a, a, a backbone of, of um, in my music that um, um, is t connected to the roots, but I've never... Um, I think what's happening with me, it's probably on a, a subconscious level that um, this is happening because... Um, um, you know, whether it be soul, funk, you know, techno, industrial or whatever, I, I think it's, for me personally, it's got some sort of backbone that runs through the whole stream of the, all the different musics that I've listened to, from reggae right through to techno. There's something, a line that I connect the whole lot mm. through. And, yeah, very tribal. For me, it's that, I mean, it's Well, we had the wonderful thing. word somatic as well, you know, this idea of, which connects right to a sort of vibration, yeah, yeah, doesn't most it? Most definitely. A, so, um, it's, it's been a subconscious thing for me, but it does run through everything I do, I think. We hear it. We hear it, Colin. Just a quick interruption, just because someone from the audience mentioned that it's the mm. drum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, That's plain and simple, yeah. yeah. From disco through to house and techno, it's it's that it's beat, the pulse, yeah. that rhythmic, yeah. Yeah. tribal thing, you know. Lovely. Nabiha, how does that land with you, that question? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, when you think about music, like, in terms of ancest what's the ancestral links? Like, for me, what... When I think about music, I think about it as one whole thing. Like, all music comes from one place. It's been there since the start of humans, right? And I think, like, there's something really deep just in acknowledging that fact. Like, music's existed for as long as people have existed, and so it's, like, one of the oldest things we have. And so I can think... For me, like, when you asked that question, I was thinking, OK, what are the, like, most... There's, there's three experiences that I've had, which I'll always remember as, like, my deepest musical experiences. One of them actually not connected to a drum, but it was... One was in Japan, in Kyoto, where I was in this in these, like, temple grounds of this temple that was not, like, touristy or anything. And then suddenly I heard this shakuhachi music. Shakuhachi is, like, a uh, Japanese bamboo flute coming out of a hut. And I had to stop, and it made me start crying because the music was one of the most beautiful things that I'd ever heard. And it was raining, and there was no one around, and I couldn't even see who was playing the instrument. I could just hear it. And I wasn't supposed to be there. I was just like stumbled across it and it just like, I don't know, it hit something so deep inside me. And then the, the other time that happened to me was on a beach in Sierra Leone at night listening to boo-boo music, which is again like these bamboo instruments. And, and it's a group of musicians and they all have like a different sized bamboo pipe. They can only play one note and it's all polyphonic and interlocking rhythms and they all like go around um, in a circle while they play and there's drums and... You know, I was there just as a visitor again, but, like, the feeling that I felt in those two instances made me realise, like, there's something that you can feel from music even when you're, like, an outsider because maybe you're not an outsider because it's all linked to the same thing. And the third, which was most recent and probably the most literal ancestral link, was earlier this year in Pakistan, in Lahore, I went to Dhamal, which, I mean, there was hardly... I mean, yeah, it was a pre pretty crazy experience. It's at this Sufi shrine, and it's this thing that happens, like, every Thursday night, all these people, mostly men, turn up. But not all men, actually. I mean, I posted something on Instagram, and it was like, how did it feel to be a woman in that space? I was like, well, you have to go straight to that question, and it's not even about that, because there were other women. But anyway, that's a separate thing. But anyway, so imagine, like, a really hot night, People, they drink this thing called bhang, which is like a mixture. It's like a weed smoothie. That's the best way to describe it. And it gets you super high. Mm -hmm. And the whole, you know, that sect of Sufism, they believe the closest way to get to the divine energy or God is through music and dance and singing. And, and a movement. bit of weed. 
and, and a bit of weed, but they had these drums and it was so loud and there's all these drummers playing these tall drums and just like the most intricate, loud rhythms and like the people, they dance until they get into a trance. The way that you see those men moving is just, they were in touch with something that maybe none of us will ever be in touch with in this lifetime. But I also felt something at that time and it made me even think of like just being at that Abishanti sound system at Carnival, you know, when the mm. bass drum gets inside your body and I had that same feeling in Lahore so for me it's about like all these experiences but all aligning in some way or other and the most important thing is to just listen to op music with an open mind and that's maybe the way you can get in touch lovely. with the ancestral lovely energy. um Charlie Sorry, top that we had Sierra Leone Lahore Japan <laughs> where are you going Batsy <laughs> I am going to I'm a black African dude from South London who has been fortunate enough to somehow navigate a DJ career where many others have failed. <laughs> so when I, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, serious, you know, because there are a lot of us who never even got a chance to start because our parents were like, there's no way that's going to happen for you. Yeah? <laughs> so when I step up to a set of turntables, I don't really consider myself to be a DJ. I consider myself to be someone who's sharing 50 years of black British club music with my audience. I'm hoping to make an impression. I'm hoping that they, at some point, have a deep listening moment where they realize the connections between the titles of the tracks and the journey that we've gone on, and they might realize that the funky house tune has the same rhythmical pattern as the High Life record that I played half an hour earlier. For me, it's always been about rebellion, and it's always about saying to people, we're here, and we matter, and we're important, and we're not going away anytime soon. Regardless of what barriers are placed up in front of us, we shall overcome at all times. And it's about giving people a history lesson, you know, and being unafraid. And what I've really loved about this conversation is the word black music has been mentioned without embarrassment. Because a lot of rooms you go into no and there's kind of people who dance around and black music. Like, oh. And they're going to And I've been someone who's been, you know, gone from, oh, you're the kid that listens to black music, we don't really want to know about you. Oh, now you listen to urban music. Oh, you're actually quite interesting. Oh, actually, no, we don't want to listen to you because urban music is quite violent, and so on and so forth. And so I just think, you know, for me, it's like some people have the luxury of being able to play the music, dig, the, dig for the music, buy the music, share the music, without having that on their shoulders. I'm happy to carry that on my shoulders. Mm. And I think it's important that there are people like myself and the people on this panel who are out there who actually are just kind of trying to do this DJ thing and this music thing on a slightly deeper level. Because you don't have to do it this way. This is a difficult way. There's a much easier way that you can do it. <laughs> this is much more financially rewarding. You know? Play your Drake business, yes. I just, because I'm still sitting with that question because there's something that I feel like I hope we get at when we go home and reflect. Because certainly, and let me just speak for black American music, the line between black American music and black American suffering is very thin. Very thin. So how are you listening ancestrally based on where you are in that line and on that line really, really matters, right? Like how, how and so I think, especially the somatic response, if you were listening to black folks describe you know, what it means to live in a context of experiencing premature death, what it means of experiencing violence, like what, what does it mean to listen, let alone profit from, mm -hmm. but what does it mean to listen to the suffering? Do you hate that suffering? Do you hate the suffering like you love the music? And that's a necessary correlation. Uh, uh, that was a very beautiful way to finish. I know I should have given you the last word, but I'm not. I'll give you the last word. I'm going to take the last word of this bit and just say that you're reminding me of, a, of, of my experience on a dance floor with my teachers, Norman Jay, mm. playing Esther Phillips, Home is Where the Hatred Is. Yeah. And the fact that it's a dance tune, I prefer her version to, to Gil's version because his is a better dance tune, but Whoa. while you're dancing... They take you through the experience of being a drug addict, someone who's hated, someone who's reviled. Right. And you can do both things at the same time in a weird way. And in fact, it brings your body into the, into the process of processing that. And it is someone else's experience, not your own. Um, but, you know, although it's a very, you, you recognize the humanity of the suffering and you can, you can orientate yourself to the humanity of that suffering while you are dancing and loving the music. And I agree that I think that's a, a vital pairing.
listen, it's not over, right? It's, this, is just, this is just the first set. The next set, which is a shorter one, is going to be just outside there. There's a little lobby. There probably isn't enough snacks for everyone to even have any snacks, but that's where we will be. There's enough for everyone to have a grape. And the, if you're smart, you can grab a hold of this panel and get them chatting and talking and extending and talking, because I know you want to talk to them more. And then we're going to go into the Students' Union, and then there's going to be more talking, but there's going to be loud music, there's going to be dancing. Tim here is going to be playing, and I hope you join us and come and just celebrate and talk. And I just want you to help me thank this amazing group of people, Charlie Nabiha, Colin. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And I'll see you in the lobby. I've got you for me. Thank you.